Hello, I'm Jeremy, and today I'm going to be talking about my favorite games of 2020. So, it goes without saying, I'm sure, that 2020 was a, a very uh, life-altering year for most people, and that includes me, and I definitely altered many aspects of my life, not the least, which would include the way that I played board games and really interacted with the hobby. You know, definitely at the start of the quarantine, I made a concerted decision to not spend my entire life online. So um, that included not doing online board gaming, which isn't my preferred way of playing games to begin with, but then also, you know, not really doing these videos for the time being, partially out of the fact that I was playing fewer games and the way that I was playing games was changing. I was mostly playing two-player games at home, um, and I wasn't, you know, playing a lot of uh, group games. I was being exposed to fewer games, uh, probably over the course of this year than maybe over the last few years. Um, but also, I, I would say that um, I didn't want to maybe feed into, you know, a cult of the new or an acquisition or give the sense that I'm out here, you know, playing games nonstop when we're in a very serious time and, you know, there are many people who were being shut off from their social circle. So I, I kind of took a, a step back just because of, you know, those factors. Um, but, and also, I guess I also, because of the way that my game playing changed over 2020, um, I was debating whether or not, you know, it was a, a good year to make a list like this, even though I've done it for the last few years and I ultimately decided to just take a few extra months to play some more of those 2020 releases um, and yeah you know, formulate my opinions a little bit more just based on you know the the circumstances that we we're in and that I suppose everybody's in so um, without further ado um, I guess I'll get on to my list um, I usually when I make this list will segregate out uh, the games that are re themings or re-implementations of games that previously existed, so I tried to do that again this year. Um, so I'm sort of presenting my list in three parts. I have my re-implementation slash expansion slash reprint category. I have an honorable mention category, which is maybe about 10 games. And then I have a, a formalized, you know, top 10. So I'll be pre presenting maybe those honorable mentions in alphabetical order, top 10, as a bit of a countdown. I should say that even though, you know, I I was playing fewer games, I was still able to play plenty of games. I, I was very, I guess, fortunate in that regard, and um, uh, that I have a partner who's willing to play, you know, heavier games with me, and that's terrific. Uh, so, and even though I didn't play every single game that I wanted to play over the course of the year, uh, certainly a lot of the he more heavy more multiplayer focused games uh, I had to put them to the back burner. I still had no problem coming up with a list of games I thought were worth mentioning. So that's really a testament I think to the uh, the strength of the hobby as, as a whole uh, that the average release that we're getting is still worth worth remembering at the end of a year. So without further ado I think I'll start with my re-implementation slash reprint slash expansion category and then we'll move on to the uh, just generalized favorite games of the year. So the first game that I have on this list is absolutely one of my favorite Euro games of all time that was just reprinted this year, uh, the Hansa Teutonica Big Box Edition and that's you know one of my favorite Euro games hands down maybe top 10 game ever maybe top 20 who knows um, and some of the components that are in that box were difficult for people to get their hands on, some of the small expansions and whatnot. So it's great to have that whole game, which is, I think, has come over the last 10 years or so to be regarded as a real masterpiece of the Euro for the reasons that it is, you know, interactive and really unique in the way that um, it plays. Uh, there's a tech tree, but there's also route building, and, you know, it combines these uh, elements in a way that no other game really does. It's really, you know, an exceptional game. I think plenty of people have begun to sing its praises. Um, I think it was seen as a little bit soulless early on, but now it feels like most people who like Euro games to any degree could understand the strength of that game, so it's really great to see it in a new edition with its various expansions and whatnot all packed in. Uh, so that is my uh, first game on that list. The second one is Winter Kingdom. This is the uh, spin-off game from King Kingdom Builder. It's the same designer and essentially it's 
I think, being pitched maybe as a gamer's version of of Kingdom Builder, uh, which is a pretty uh, casual, family-friendly game. I think it won the Spiels of Jars. Uh, this is maybe a step up from that in complexity. Maybe it's similar to playing Kingdom Builder with an expansion or two thrown in, depending on, or a mini expansion thrown in. Uh, it just adds a little bit of rules overhead, but it also gives you a handful of cards that will be the special powers that you get over the course of the game. So it gives you a little bit of strategic planning. Although the, the original Kingdom Builder had that too because you acquired special powers by uh, branching out on the board. So um, it's just really just a tweaking of what was already existing with Kingdom Builder. That's why I would include it on this you know, expansion, re-implementation list as opposed to the, the formal list. But I've really enjoyed my plays of it. It's surprisingly quick, uh, just like the original Kingdom Builder is. Um, it doesn't necessarily take that much longer. You know, it's not that much more of a gamer's game, but I, I guess it is. Um, and, you know, I wouldn't say that I necessarily prefer it over Kingdom Builder. Uh, I, I think they both have their place. Maybe not necessary to own both, but I, I really have enjoyed my plays of it thus far. Moving forward, uh, I have on my list uh, Kalis 1303, which is the re-implementation of Kalis. Uh, this one, I, I have to say that um, I've played several times pretty much before the, the lockdown, and I didn't have um, enough, and I liked the changes, and some of the changes were versus the original Kalis were, were a little bit more questionable, and I didn't have time to really play it enough to get a for, formal opinion about which one I prefer. but. Uh, certainly there are some nice streamlinings of the original Kalis here. Uh, there's also some things that are a little bit quirky, like adding special player powers into that game and making it a little bit more constrained as far as what the length of the game is going to be, as opposed to having that be dynamically decided upon by the players. But it really you know, cuts down like the money factor from the game, uh, just replacing it entirely with your meeples. Um, and a lot of smart design decisions were made were put into that game, which is really one of the you know premier, uh, real first blockbuster worker placement games to bring it maybe more in step with the games that are coming out today. And I you know I've enjoyed it. I I want to play it more. And I hope like in general these games that um, came out in 2020 this uh, rather unfortunate year don't just fall by the wayside as the 2021 20, games come out. I hope people get them to the table. Um, even if they weren't able to during this year. And this is definitely one of the games I hope that really happens with. Next one is a game called Break the Code, and this is on this list because it's apparently a reprint of a, Korea, or a Japanese game. Um, I believe it's Japanese and it was printed in Korea, but this is the Western release of it. And I think it's put out by Asmodee, and it's a, a really si simple little deduction game that I had a lot of fun playing with uh, two-player over the course of this year. Um, it's basically a, a variant or a, a, a game that's similar to Code 777, that old classic deduction game, or kind of like a very simplified version of Sleuth, where you have a number code in front of you, and those numbers have color coding and whatnot on them, and there's a number of cards that are placed in the center of the table. Each player has um, takes alternating turns picking a card um, and asking the question that's printed on the card about the other player's number and it works differently with different players uh, configurations the way that the information sharing happens but in a two-player game it's just back and forth and it's essentially a race to deduce the other's code before they could figure out yours so because of the way that the card system works um, it's not open-ended questioning um, so that makes it a little bit more of a simplified game but it also creates opportunities where you could you know if there's a card there that if that question is asked, it will immediately give away your code. You could take that card and ask the question of the other player, eliminating it from the realm of possibilities that's going to be asked from you, even if it doesn't give you more information. So because of those little quirks in it, um, I've really enjoyed my plays of it for like a game that takes maybe 10 minutes to play through a round. So you can just play over and over. A uh, pretty fun game. That is Break the Code. Next game on this list is Bytes. This is um, a re-implementation of Big Points, which is, I think, one of the uh, the games that was in a classic German only, I believe, maybe only Europe uh, line called Easy Play, which was a number of filler games that came in similar sized boxes, maybe about 10 to 12 years ago. Um, and these games, you know, they never really came out in the U.S. officially, but they 
you know, garnered at that time a cult following. There were, you know, uh, Finito is another game that was in that line that really uh, people have, you know, glommed onto and, you know, probably deserves a reprint of its own. But this bites this version of Big Points. It rethemes it to be Ants at a Picnic. It's essentially a really simplified game of shared incentives where you're uh, using the ants in this version to collect colored tokens, which are beautiful. The game uh, components are really cute now, whereas they were totally abstract before. Um, to, to collect these uh, tokens, all players are sharing the pawns, so e any player could basically move any pawn, and then at the time that a pawn reaches the end point, it'll determine the scoring for a given color, which you could use to, you know, screw over somebody who's collecting a color that you're not. And it's a really simple game, plays in maybe 20 minutes or so, but it's one that I enjoyed a lot in the Big Points version. I'm glad that it's finally officially coming out in the U.S., so it deserves mention on this list. Um, the next game is Clever Cubed, I believe is a U.S. title. This is the Gaunt Sean Clever third uh, version, although there were score pads for the first and second version, that alternate score pads, so maybe it's the fifth version of it. But this is maybe the most, you know, essentially a new score sheet for the Gaunt Sean Clever game, and I've really enjoyed my plays of this one. Um, it has some of the slightly more complex rules than maybe the first one in terms of the ways that you could uh, fill in numbers on your sheet, but it's really much more of the same, I would say. The one thing that I think in this game that really opens the strategic possibilities is one of your special powers here is to uh, take a die but use your special power to, uh, for you, change the value on that die. And that really, in a game that's all about creating scoring combos by use, linking dice bonuses to dice bonuses, that really could open up your ability to do that. And so I've really enjoyed my play of this one. It might be, I think, my favorite um, of the three so far, although I, I, I do really enjoy them all. So that's Clever Cubed. Uh, next one, and I should preface by saying I think this is technically a 2019 release. They didn't play till 2020, and there might be some others on this list that are like that, is Railroad Evolution. This is a expansion for Railroad Revolution, which is a game that was put out by, I believe, What's Your Game? Um, maybe four years ago, and this expansion is really expensive. It's almost like a uh, second edition in terms of what it changes. It gives you a brand new board for the game that makes you just essentially set the other board aside uh, if you're playing with this expansion, and it changes up a lot of the niggling issues that people had with the first game. And, and in some ways, it, it makes it a brand new game. Uh, for the for in many respects, there's certainly like a new way that you, for example, score end game points. But uh, the original game, I think, had some balance issues. Most people found, and there there were designer tips to tweak that. And this just essentially just does a soft reboot almost of the game and gives you a new way to play that feels a lot more um, strategic, I would say. So it's one that I've really enjoyed. It's I actually am perfectly fine playing the original Railroad Revolution. Um, but this one is a, a nice uh, variation on what had come before, fixes a lot of, what's, of what it does. It really is, by the standards of board game expansions, one that really kind of radically changes what you had, um, at least by Euro game board game expansions. So Railroad Evolution. Uh, just have a few more on here. The next one is Mysterium Park. Uh, Mysterium is a game that always sounded better to me in theory than usually when I was playing it. After my first few plays of it, I felt that it dragged on, and Mysterium Park is simply a distillation of Mysterium into maybe a 20-25 minute game, and uh, that is about how long I want to be playing Mysterium. Um, it's not my favorite type of game, but um, I find that at that length, it's just a good interactive experience. Uh, it doesn't wear out its welcome in any way at 20, game, 20 minutes. So it really cuts down a lot on the rules and then also on the uh, setup time in a way that I think really makes that for me a better experience. I could totally understand if uh, Mysterium fans felt that was too short or that wasn't as thematic. You know, the original Mysterium has like that elaborate um, uh, set up for the, the ghost player um, that is eliminated here, but um, for me and what I'm looking to get out of that game, it's a really nice slimming down of something. It's something that has basically become something that I'm totally fine playing uh, versus something that maybe I would choose not to play at you know an hour plus that it would take to play the full game of Mysterium. Next one is Predaporte. 
which is um, an old, I believe it's Vital Lacerda game. For, it's been put out in a new edition. I believe it might have come out at the end of 2019 by Czech Games Edition, I think. Um, and this is a game that, uh, when it originally came out, has slightly or a pretty badly translated rule book. So getting the new edition with new graphics and a new rule book is great. And also, um, I think that when it came out, it was definitely seen as an extremely heavy euro, which it is a heavy euro, but there's been a bit of a creeping up of complexity in the, the, the uh, terms of euro games. So now when this comes out, it's not that complicated at all. It's still a little bit punishing for sure, but it's it's nowhere near you know standing head and shoulders above the other games of its ilk in 2020 like it was when the game first came out. So in that sense, the game was a bit ahead of its time. And I think it's dated pretty well. It's a nice economic game where you're essentially running a fashion house, which people I remember 10 years ago or so had real problems with. A theme, I think, is some masculine issues uh, with the game. Uh, to me, that never bothered me. But the, you know, the rules translation uh, was not great. And then it seemed, like I said, especially heavy when it came out at that time. Now it's not, as, it doesn't feel as heavy to me in in you know the current time to play that game and uh the rule book is more well written and just in general it's a more pleasant experience and the last game on this list is iwari which is the latest iteration of the game classic game by michael shock web of power or um han or china it's had many iterations over the years and this is i think the most attractive iteration of that it also has some rules tweaks in there i've only played it once at two player which is not the way to play this game i have to say but just based on the production components of the components and the production value of the game overall um i'm happy to put it on this list i look forward to playing it some more with three players which is probably how you want to play that game um so uh j just you know based on what i got in the box when it came um iwari is making this list also based on i would say on my experience having played the other games its predecessors the china the web of power which are games i like they're nice area control games with nice simple rules that um have a lot of room within the simple rules for clever play all right, so that is my list of you know my re-implementations, my reprints, my expansions. And now I'm going to just move on to my honorable mentions. I have 10 of these, I think, and I'm going to be listing them off in alphabetical order. I'll try to talk briefly about each one, and then we'll move on to the uh, top 10. So the first game that I have on my honorable mentions list is Conspiracy Abyss Universe, the awkwardly titled uh, game. And this is a, a really superb f filler where uh, players are going to take turns drafting cards and you essentially have, it's based I guess on the Abyss board game, a full-fledged uh, big box board game that came out, I don't know, six, seven years ago. And in this one, you're really distilling a lot of the elements of that game down into something that could be played in maybe 15, 20 minutes or so. And it does a really good job of that. Essentially, it has a pressure luck element where you are flipping cards up. And by flipping up more cards, you're giving more choices to your opponents. Um, and then you're going to take those cards when you choose them and add them to essentially a pyramid. You're building a five-width five, uh, pyramid over the course of the game and you're worried about which cards are going to be placed next to each other and they all scored in the different ways and some of the cards that you're going to get have special powers that will trigger and just um the thought that goes into drafting each card for a 15 or 20 minute filler is really quite uh invigorating i think and it maybe it's not a game that you're going to want to play you know 200 times you know over you know before you feel like you've seen everything that it has to offer but every time i've pulled it out and played it you know for 15 minutes it's it's more than entertain me so it's a game that i've really enjoyed um there's just you know a nice push your luck element which a lot of filler games have but there's also some strategic considerations in the set collection that it, it offers so a really enjoyable game that's conspiracy of this universe the next game is one that uh i really have not seen uh get any buzz whatsoever it's called don carlo it's uh, a small car a small box car game that's put out i believe only in germany i think nsv is the publisher forgive me if i'm wrong on any of these things i'm just going off the top of my head and then last year i haven't been obsessively searching out games like i might have in the past uh but it's essentially a area control game where each player is giving a deck of cards i think they go from zero through six and 
um, there's a board or essentially a common area where there are cards set out that have either ranges of numbers like 0 through 3 or specific numbers like 6, 7, 8 on them. And each turn the player is going to draw four cards from their stack and then using up to three of those cards they're going to place the, a code, a unique code at one of those areas that adds up to the number that's uh, at it. So for example at the seventh thing they could play you know, uh, 2, 2, 3 at the seven, but then another player couldn't play two, two, three at the seven. Every time you play a card to a stack, you get a, a point for every um, previously played stack that's there, which you know could accumulate you points uh, as more players do it. And then at the end of the game, whoever has the most stacks at each thing gets the card, which is worth the number of points that's printed on the card. So the seven card is worth seven points. So there's these two competing interests in scoring. It's a you know twenty minute card game. Well, it's one that allows for real clever play, whether you're going to focus on, you know, just trying to be alone or nearly alone at an area that players aren't playing at, or if you're going to just keep dumping cards into areas, you know, that you're not necessarily competing at because there's a lot of cards there, uh, because you're going to get points for however many previous combinations have been played there. So it's a, a really uh, curious game, um, one that, you know, has more depth than it initially appears. It's probably one that I'll do a video for because it's just completely under the radar, might be Germany only. I had to import it, um, and that's the kind of game that I like to, to showcase. So... It's, it's one that I've really enjoyed. That is Don Carlo. Next one is on this list, uh, as an honorable mention, largely because it, you know, is it a game? As a question comes up around it, this is Micro Macro Crime City. And it's more of a, a one-off or a, an experience that you share with people as opposed to a proper game. Um, a lot of the uh, gaming that I've done over the course of this last year has been, you know, the various escape rooms in a box or the... Um, mystery boxes that you could get you know mailed to you on a monthly uh, basis i've been doing those you know to supplement you know my gaming and those have been enjoyable but this one i think just feels like novel although it's to a certain degree just you know where's waldo with a plot uh you essentially f put out a giant map you could look up other videos i believe on on this you put up a giant map that you follow cards that ask you questions about the various things that you could see on this drawing which looks like a giant where's waldo or richard scary uh drawing and it shows people over the course of the city but not just they don't just occur once you essentially could trace their path backwards by following a figure and you'll see them at earlier points in time and from doing that you could deduce things about you know where they were before you know they got murdered or um who they saw before they went to the grocery store, these sorts of things. And they lead into various mysteries. And there's maybe only, you know, this is like a one-off game, much like those escape rooms in the box. But, um, and it maybe takes four hours or so to play through, although there are additional mysteries, I guess, posted online. I haven't done those. You have just done the, the ones that come in the box on the cards. Um, but just generally speaking, it just feels like an activity or a game, if, whichever word you prefer, that I haven't really done yet before in board gaming. So it's, and it's one that you could imagine that, you know, a lot of people would enjoy, you know, experiencing. It's probably, probably best maybe as a two player game, just, you know, because if you have too many people crowding around the map, you will have your visibility obstructed because the map is mammoth. Um, so maybe, you know, that makes it one of the perfect perfect games to play during, you know, a quarantine. So I, I enjoyed my few hours with it, and I'm, I, you know, I hope, I'd, I'd like to see what they do next with the idea, what other designers, you know, might do with it. Uh, that is Micro Macro Crime City. So next game on my list is Monasterium. This is um, a game that I put on my honorable mentions because although I've played it, you know, several times and enjoyed it, um, I've only played it at two player, and I really can't vouch. When I went on to Board Game Geek, uh, a lot of people seem to suggest that it's not great at higher player counts. I don't know. I haven't played it at those higher player counts. Um, so something that I've, I, I've I haven't been you know obsessively like going online to read about board games in any by any stretch of the imagination. So when I was doing a little bit of the research for this list, I would look at the comments for the games I wanted to discuss and. Uh, you know, so definitely a lot of people have
put comments on there about games that they've played online, which to me is a very distinct experience than this. So I'm not sure if that's factoring into the opinions I've read online. So it'll take a while to normalize, I think, the opinions on a lot of our 2020 games because playing a game on you know a board game arena or your tabletop simulator or what have you uh, I think skews your opinion of what that game is. I and I'm not knocking those those experiences. I mean, more power to anybody who enjoys th those things. But I think that you know things like fiddliness of you know could maybe be you know less of an issue online, or maybe m be more of an issue depending on how the game is implemented online. Any case. Uh, like I said, uh, this game, Monasterium, which is what I'm actually talking about, um, it's been, it's essentially an area control game where you have to be very deliberate about the way that you, um, you're essentially controlling a little cart that moves across the map, but um, based on where that cart is, it could send cubes or people into various monasteries, and you're competing for various objectives to have certain guys in certain places. Or to just have more in a given place. Or to have somebody in every place on the map. And so it's an area control game, but you have to really telegraph where you're going to be going and where you're going to be placing your workers. Which makes it work a lot more than most two-player area controls would, would work. Um, it's all, To do your actions, it's dice drafting, so there's a lot of interactivity in that. Not every player can do every action every turn based on the luck of the dice, and certain actions get more powerful the more of a number that's rolled. And I could see that driving certain people crazy, but in a two-player game where you get a lot of dice, that hasn't been a factor for me. Um, apparently, there are fewer neutral dice in the, the overall pool uh, per player in a four-player game which might make it feel like you're more constrained by luck. I can totally understand that, but again, I haven't played that. But I have enjoyed my it, it, my plays of the game to date, so that's why I put it on my list. So that is Monasterium. Next game on my list is Mon Monster Expedition. This is a game designed by Alexander Pfister, and it's really a take on the classic Reiner Knizia game, uh, Picomino, and it's essentially a dice-rolling game where... You're just setting aside dice, and it a, has a push your luck element where each side, each time you roll the many dice that you get, you have to set aside a different value than you set aside on your previous roll. So if you can't do that because you've rolled only values that you've previously set aside, you bust. So that's like the basic crux of the game. But here you're doing this not just to get a certain you know high number. You're doing it to um, get a number that will allow you to capture a card, which will have a special power on it or just be a, a vessel for points. And it's just a nice tweaking of a game that, you know, Picomino is one of my favorite uh, dice filler games. So this just adds a nice little... Um, you know, wrinkle of uh, complexity and decision making to that previous game, and it, it's it, by no means do I think it's an absolute classic of the genre, and it's probably so, you know relatively forgettable in the the grand scheme of things. But it's a game that I've really enjoyed my plays of uh, over the course of this year. Um, so the next game that I wanted to talk about is On Mars. This is a game that I actually played several times, maybe like five times before quarantine began in March and then I haven't played for the rest of the year and um, it's a, a hulking Vital this is a Vital Lacerda game I think I accredited another game to Vital Lacerda that wasn't Vital Lacerda but maybe I'm mistaken um, that has you know tons of moving parts there's a, essentially putting out tiles onto a map and upgrading your variant you know acquiring cards to give you special powers and then up you know upgrading your individual player board so you could do other actions more efficiently so like all of his games has many interlocking mechanisms it always feels tight there's a huge rules overhead and the reason why i would include this on my honorable mentions is because i think in the you know five or so times i played it i don't think I had a playthrough where we didn't realize, you know, near the end of the game or at, after the game that, oh, we actually played this thing wrong. And that's, of course, on me as a player, you know, to some degree. But it's also just one of those things where it's uh, questioning, uh, is this game too heavy for my cognitive load? You know, is there too much going on for me? But I have enjoyed it, and it's really, I think, a, a incredible design, the way that the things lock, lock together. And I'd happily get it back to the table once I'm, you know, playing with groups that could handle that game but um 
just for now, you know, it seems like honorable mention is an appropriate place for a game in in those circumstances. The uh, next game is Paleo. This is a cooperative game that's put out, put out by Hans and Gluck, um, and it's uh, generally speaking, I'm not a huge fan of cooperative games, but um, this one just has a lot of unique mechanisms. Essentially, the game gives you a car deck of cards. You know, each player gets a set of those cards, and then you could see based on the back generally what range of options might be on the front of that card but you never quite know so there's um, an element of push your locker making educated guesses about whether or not you want to choose to you know flip over the card and engage with it and that's just you know creates moments where you're surprised and it's an example of uh, creating a story in a game you know doing storytelling in a game without just making you read a, a, a load of text um, the game has a kind of campaign element where it gets progressively more complicated as you play on. I found that to be slightly repetitive as, as I moved for, from you know campaign to campaign, but just the overall novelty of the game and the fact that it pulled me in to the degree that it did, even though it was a cooperative game and that's not generally my, my preferred type of game, made me want to give it a mention. It's a game that I think a lot of people are going to enjoy um, and a lot of people should you know check out, especially if they're predisposed to co-ops. Next game on this list, this was a real surprise, this is Pan Am. This is, a, I guess, a, apparently a mass market game that um, I think I, I forget where I even heard about this game. I think I may have watched a video on YouTube or, or something um, because it, it is essentially a mass market game, but it's also uh, you know, a game that involves route building, economics, and um, also bidding in like, the old like, Amon Ray style of bidding. So, and the worker placement as well. So all these things are wrapped up in a game that I think I bought at like Target or, or something like that. So just a nice streamlined, relatively lightweight. You know, almost feels like a classic Euro to, in certain regards. Definitely the Almond Ray influences there. But it's a game that you know is is a little bit more than it first appeal appears. Uh, players are you know playing various airlines, trying to spread out across the map. But there's incentives to get gobbled up by the Pan Am, which is like this omnipresent airline that doesn't get controlled by any player. You just try to maneuver yourself so you get acquired by them for a cash payout. Um, and it, it's just been, you know, an enjoyable little game. It's uh, something that, you know, I, I, I was kind of surprised, you know, just even though it does have, I think, I it might be like, I, Pure Sylvester is, the, you know, so we certainly designed other licensed games and um, other games of note. So I shouldn't have been shocked by the fact that it was a quality game, but it, it did catch me off guard just because I think of the fact that it was a, a mass market game. So that is Pan Am, and yeah, worthy of this list. Next game, and next to last game on my honorable mentions list is Spicy. This is a uh, bluffing game, a card game, where players have cards that have two attributes on them, essentially a number and a type, and they're going to be playing them face down to the center of the table. You have to essentially meet the requirements of you know playing cards in successive value of the type to the to the table, and uh, you have to declare as you're placing your card face down what it is. But you only have to declare one of the two things. So you can say this is a five, and if players choose to challenge what you're saying, the card's revealed, and you know there's penalty if you're if you're challenged and you were you were bluffing, and there's a reward you know penalty to the player who challenged you if they incorrectly challenge you. So really simple bluffing game, but it just has a, a lot of uh, good dynamic um, interaction between players. This is definitely one that uh, benefits, I would imagine, for more than two players. I've played this with more than two players, unlike some of the games on this list, um, and I, I've really. Uh, I got a kick out of it. The reason why it's an honorable mention is just you know the simplistic nature of it, it which isn't itself uh, disqualifying. But um, I feel like there are games like Liar's Dice, Cockroach Poker, which I probably would place above this, and you know that are also as rule simple and in the similar genre, and, and also generate the same sort of table talk and response. But this is really a, a clever little game, and, and it's one that I really enjoyed uh, having a chance to play. The um, last game on my honorable mentions list is Zombie Teens Evolution, which is a sequel. So maybe this could have been on my re-implementations list. It's a sequel to Zombie Kids Evolution, which came out a few years ago, and I really enjoyed playing through this. This is, again, a, a cooperative campaign game, so two things I'm not 
necessarily the biggest fan of um, combined in one, but it's one that's very simple. It's essentially a really stripped down, I guess, like a tower defense game, they would call it, uh, where players are going to be cooperatively controlling figures and moving them around the board to knock out zombies so before they invade the center of the board. Um, well, not in this one. In this one, they, they have different areas where they're, they're evading. But in any case, um, it's a game that starts out very simply. You, you simply move or attack a zombie. And, but over the course of the game, as you unlock things and you know, do certain achievements, which speed your progress through the campaign, uh, the game adds rules, adds special powers, makes the zombies tougher to kill, and so on. And it's just a really enjoyable uh, game that you could maybe do two or three sessions of, unlike some uh, campaign games where you're, you're doing one session and you're burnt out by the game, and who knows when you'll get it back to the table. Here's one that you just you know, has a, a quality that you want to just get through quickly. So it's one that I really enjoyed over the course of this year. That is Zombie Teens Evolution. All right, so now I'll go on to my top ten, and I'll just forgive myself for uh, having a drink before I uh, keep talking. I don't think I've talked this much <laughs> in some time. All in one swoop. So, all right, and here I actually bothered to get the games and uh, in physical copies uh, on my table. So my number ten, ten game, and this is actually three games. It's the uh, Key series. There are three of these. I just brought one of them out. This is uh, called uh, the Key Sabotage and Lucky Llama Land. This is the third and the most complex in the uh, series. Uh, but these are maybe twenty minute or so deduction games for um, up to four players. They involve. They are real time. Um, but they don't have a lot of the drawbacks of a lot of real-time games. Essentially, you're going to take a deck of cards, which have uh, a certain number on the back, like two or f up to, I think, four, based on how powerful the clue on the card is, and you just spread them all around the table. And then as you, once you say go, players just start taking cards and then recording on what the clue that's on the back. And there's various things that players are trying to find out. So in one, you're trying to find out the time that something was stolen, or you might need to find out you know, the contents of a suitcase. The, the, the three games in the series have various crimes that you're trying to solve. And over the course of the, the three games, the uh, crimes have more component things that you're trying to look for. Um, so the first one, I think, only has three things that you're looking for, whereas the last one has five. Uh, and you're just um, you know, picking up these cards, looking at them. So they'll tell you on the back of the cards something about what type of clue they might have on it. But it might be redundant information you don't know. So there is an element of luck in that. But you're generally going to be getting guided information about what is on the card that you're taking. And then once you feel like you have it, you just stop. And then the other player, uh, they figure out when they have it, you, they stop, and then you add up the values of the cards that you have, and whoever has more efficiently solved the mystery of wins. And it's just a game that really um, uh, feels fresh. Um, has a lot of um, there's a lot of deduction games are real brain burners, and you feel like you know if you make one mistake, everything will blow up for all, the whole entire game. You'll ruin it for everybody. But here, you know, it's essentially multiplayer solitaire. Each player is just drawing cards from a common pool and uh, using them. Which you know does deny players the access to those cards, but then using them to make their own deductions. So it does have a very constrained uh, feel to it, which which I think is is nice. It makes it more of an approachable family game, and you know. So like I said, it's just it's just a game that feels like it has a lot of unique design decisions in it, and it's one that I enjoyed. I guess for deduction games this year, I also saw the release of uh, the search for Planet X, which I could have just as easily included on this game. That's a, definitely more of a, a game along you know the classic sleuth and whatnot, but also a game that uh, feels like it's worthy of succeeding those. It's definitely heavier than the key, even probably on its easiest uh, settings, uh, and it's more of a 45 minute to an hour brain burner. Um, than the key is, which is you know even in the most complex version, maybe a 20 minute game. But um, yeah, I I just thought I would say all you know all three games in the key series are enjoyable. You if you were only going to get one, you'd want to decide if you want an easy one or a hard one, and uh, you could probably do the hard one and be fine. But um, really, just a neat experience. Um, so moving on, my number nine game 
is a party game, which is not necessarily what I would expect in this year, but it is called Cross Clues. And this is a game that is really simple. It's a, maybe a 10 minute game. It's real time. And it's a game where uh, you're going to have a, a, a grid, essentially A through E and 1 through 5, with um, each of those letters and numbers having a word associated with it. So you might have A, B, dog, and 1, B, you know, gray. And then you'll have a deck of cards that uh, correspond with the coordinates that are created. So you have a card for A1, for B1, etc. And players are going to just take those cards and then it'll tell them what coordinate. And without showing out to the other players, they will say a clue that course a one word clue that corresponds to those two words. So trying to direct other players to guess with their single guess the word that was at that, you know, those two po points uh, or those two uh, words point at. So very simple, and um, it's a game that, you know, is a party game. It plays up to six, although it, it works perfectly fine at two, where each player just sits there and quizzes each other back and forth under the speed of the, uh, t or under the stress of the uh, timer. And you're just trying to basically compete, you know, cooperatively against your previous best score. And it's one that, you know, really f seems to be... You know, a, a perfect uh, distillation of, you know, a lot of similar party games. Obviously, Codenames comes to mind, but because of the real-time element of it, it's almost more engaging than code, Codenames. I wouldn't say it's a better game or a better design than Codenames, but it's one that I think gives you more immediate enjoyment than Codenames, whereas that Codenames sometimes is thinky as you're trying to puzzle out the, the exact perfect clue. Here, because you're under the pressure of the time, you know, and you're really just trying to find one word that connects two other words, not the most taxing thing. Um, it's just a snappier game, and players only get one guess. You get only get one one word clue, and you you know you have to do about tw you know twenty five of those clues in about five ten minutes. So it just has a much faster pace, much less downtime, and that's why I really enjoy it. So uh, a really clever game. Uh, it's almost like what why didn't they do this before? It feels almost like a game show or something. Although when you're going with two players asking each other back and forth, and that's the way that I've played this the most, and and it, it's I think you know, one of the gems from this year. Next game, completely different, is right here. This is Takanu, Obelisk of the Sun. This is uh, the latest game from the uh, Daniela Tashini, who it has, I guess, a trilogy of games that start with the letter T that are kind of set in the ancient world um, that are heavy Euro games. This one is um, essentially a dice drafting game where uh, players are going to be um, drafting dice from a central pool, which, you know, some dice, that, which correspond to six different sections of the board, which are all various, essentially, mini-games. So it's a point salad game like the previous games in this series uh, with interlocking mechanisms. So you might do something here that affects your ability to do something in the other position, part of the board, that sort of thing. And you're trying to collect resources to build various, uh, you know, towers and or, or tombs or whatever they are yeah, very abstracted game to be honest although there's you know an egyptian theme and it looks nice and has a nice obelisk that stands in the the center of the board you're all just doing things you know for the pharaoh to please the pharaoh like in many of these games but that doesn't really detract from the enjoyment that you get out of the game um just watching all the mechanisms click connect together it's definitely less stressful and a quicker play than you know zulkin which is i think you know the heaviest game in the series um and it's more tail tail to walk on the second game in this uh, series. It's probably even lighter than that, but not by much. It, it has a lot going on for sure. Um, I feel like some of the things that I've uh, noticed during the game is some of the scoring cards might be slightly off balance. I don't know if that's just because I've played it mostly two player, um, uh, or if that's you know a real issue. Um, but um, I've enjoyed my plays of it. You know, I, I think that's pretty. Once you've internalize the mechanisms it flows really nicely and um it's enjoyable so um i probably would you know play this anytime over sulkin which makes my head want to explode the way that the, the timing of that game works here it's much more straightforward even though it has a timing mechanism in it, in it with the way that the dice pool works but it's a game that i think is you know worth recommending so that is uh Tekanu, the obelisk of the sun
All right. Uh, next game on my list, number seven, is right here. Need of Lawyer. This is a game that is. Uh, it's a. This is a uh, essentially an auction game with blind bidding, uh, which is. I think something that a lot of players don't like. It's a set collection game where you're using blind bidding to acquire, to choose to get the right to choose first from a group of cards that are available to all players at the start of the round. So you're using various coins to, to make your bids and you place them face down then they're all revealed and whoever has the highest coin gets to take the, the card of their choice and so on down the line with each player getting essentially a card from each segment of the board. And these cards have various uh, scoring capabilities. Some of them want you just to collect a lot of them in that set. Other ones, um, want, you know, there's an incentive to collect one of each type of card that will give you a special card, you know. So there are all these various point salad uh, scoring mechanisms. But the really clever thing, and the thing that, you know, I think makes this game worthy of being on the list is the way that the bidding works. Essentially, uh, you have, at any given time, there's going to be three areas where you could place your bids to get cards. And if you have among your coins that you're bidding a zero coin, which when you use that to bid, you're foregoing the opportunity to take one of those cards, which is the way that you're going to get points and build your engine, so to speak, in this game. Um, but what it lets you do is lets you upgrade your your um, your coins that you've used so that they're more powerful on the future round. So bouncing those two things is always fun, and and watching it, you know, the there's legitimate excitement sometimes. Um, as you're flipping over the coins and finding out who got you know the best thing and maybe you got a really good card that you wanted because other players didn't need it. So it's just an engaging game the whole way through, even though it's you know distilled to a simple blind bidding me mechanism just with some tacked on set collection. It's just one that really, you know, uh, has been enjoyable. I do think that the game would really benefit from an expansion, maybe have different factions of, of cards. You're essentially, I think, thematically recruiting dwarves to fight, I don't know, uh, the, the um, people who are invading the dwarves, whatever that might be. Um, and uh, you're essentially seeing every card, every game, ba with some removed based on the player count. And I think that just having it different factions that you could bring into the game or take out of the game would give it a little bit more replay value than it might have as is. But just right, you know, based on my plays so far, I've really enjoyed the dynamic way that those auctions work. Um, and it's a game, I think it's one of those games that is an auction game that people who don't necessarily like auction games because they're nervous about the valuations or whatever would really still be able to enjoy because it's very simple. You have, It almost works like raw the Knizia game in the way that you are placing your bids. All right, uh, number six. My number six game is by uh, Stefan Feld, who's a regular, uh, uh, makes regular appearances on this list. This is Bonfire. This is a pretty heavy game. The box says 70 to 100 minutes. Um, and it's like many of these games on my list. It's The theme is really nothing to write home about. I, I, I think it's some... Um, planet or some fantasy land where the game is taking place and who knows what you're doing it's actually a game where i've found the theme got in the way of my ability to communicate the uh the concepts of the game but that's neither here nor there because what the game actually is it's it reminds me a lot thematically of the felt game luna which also had some wonky druid uh celebration theme here you're lighting bonfires to i don't know to power the planet or something i i forget honestly and it, i wish it had something that was a little bit more tied to reality but really it's an excuse for a bunch of interlocking mechanisms like many steph stefan fell games and i, I really enjoy the ones that the, that are offered up here essentially what's great about this game in particular is that it's very open-ended you are going to be using these uh, little Tetris pieces, or I guess they're all the same shape, but these little pieces to create patterns on your board, which will give you action tokens, which you then spend uh, to do your various actions. But you, there's various mini games, like many of these other you know, heavier Euros, that you're trying to accomplish your things, uh, accomplish to get points over you know through various means and you really have to focus on some of those so you really can focus on some of those and ignore others to a large degree even though they do interlock um and just the open-endedness of, of the game is really what what is surprising that you could just almost ignore an entire portion of the game and still do very well um 
even in the way that you acquire, you know, essentially, you get these, like, uh, scoring tokens, which will give you various missions. But you really could go out and choose which missions you want to do and then form your strategy all, all around that. And just that ability to kind of make your own strategy over the course of the game is what's really en enjoyable here. There are also, you know, like many of these games, you know, special power cards, and you can build your, your strategy around those and what have you. But um, in general, it's one that... Um, has you know just convinced me once more that you know Feld's a terrific designer, and um, it's one that you know like I said the theme does detract from my enjoyment of it a little bit and it makes it harder to teach than it should be, but um, if you could get over those humps and you know just really relish the mechanisms for their own sake, um, it's a game that I think you'll enjoy. That is Bonfire. All right, and number five. Uh, speaking of Euros, this one is a little bit more themed. This one is Hollertau. This is Uwe Rosenberg game, so like many of his games, it's a farming game. Um, but this one is not quite... It doesn't really feel like his Agricola and Caverna uh, games. It's a really a beast of its own. Um, it's worker placement still, but it has a mechanism where uh, players could all take the same space, uh, or the same player could even take a space multiple times. They're just the costs of it go up over the course of taking the space. So that just makes the game feel a little bit more dynamic and like Bonfire, pretty open-ended. Um, other games have used that mechanism before, like Coal Baron I know had escalating costs for uh, worker placement spaces as they were taking, but here, you know, that that, that really makes us feel different than, than a lot of his uh, similar games, similarly themed games at, at least. Um, you're essentially just doing resource collection to spend to upgrade your tower or your town hall, I guess it is in this game. <laughs> and um, But the way that you're going to do that really could vary. There's a lot of flexibility in what, what resources you're going to be paying at the end of it around to do that. And there's a lot of ways that you could get those resources, just through, not th just through worker placement spaces, but also through card play. There's a lot of card play in this game, and formulating your strategy along around those cards is really satisfying. And achieving the various goals that you need to get those cards into play is enjoyable. And I guess that's sort of like Agricola for sure. But um, this just feels very much its own thing. Um, also, it's 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 the box says expert level. I noticed, uh, but. Uh, it's one that with you know two players you can play I, once you've learned the game in you know 45 minutes to an hour and that puts it in you know Nusfjord territory it doesn't really feel like Nusfjord I guess but it's it's one that you know it just flows very well it seems very focused uh, as opposed to some of uh, Rosenberg's other games which just get caught up in rules here the rules feel a little bit tighter a little bit more streamlined and the game I think benefits as a result. So that is uh, Hollertau. All right, my number four game of 2020 is uh, Kramer and Kiesling. Uh, again, people who commonly get on my list, I'm a big fan of these guys. This is Renature. This is a game that um, is an area control game played with dominoes. It's essentially a family weight game, 45 to 60 minutes, the box says, for two to four players. The uh, game is essentially uh, a game where you're creating chains of dominoes around the board, and whenever you place it, the board has uh, various uh, uh, sectioned off segments where you're going to be placing the dominoes next to. Whenever you do that, you're able to put one of your pawns into that section, and when that section gets completely surrounded, it gets evaluated for majority points. You have pawns of various uh, power, so there's a question about which pawns you want to devote to which uh, majority contests. What So the game is... Uh, one that actually, um, unlike a, a lot of area majority games, really works well at two, partially because the domino can sh the dominoes that you're placing really constrain what your options are. So it's not just you two people are just going to keep going head to head in the same area, and you know eventually one of you will, will win just because you run out of time. Uh, it doesn't play like that because the dominoes determine which areas you could actually place in and which areas you can compete in. So it almost feels like you have this artificial constraint on the actual area majority contest in the game that's at, at the core of it. So that's really appealing to me. Uh, the game almost feels like a lighter successor to Mexico, which is a game from the same designers from a few years ago, but it's very much a different game, but it just feels like that in spirit or, you know, in inspiration on a certain level. Um, and what I think really makes the game work uh, 
for me, is probably the fact that you get, in addition to your pieces, which you use to contest the area control, you get a number of neutral pieces which uh, could actually contest and win majorities in the various sections that you're contesting. And that turns the game from being into an aggressive game into a passive-aggressive game, which as a, a true Euro player, that's something that's you know, dear to my heart. And that makes for a, ro a lot of clever plays that wouldn't be possible in the game otherwise. So you could really screw up you know, two other players make, going head-to-head. -head. And there's also the clever rule that if two people end up tied in an area, their point, their pieces essentially evaporate, and then it goes to the next player in line, and that could include the neutral player. So there's a lots of rooms for clever play. There's also this, uh, there's a, some special powers that you could get, and you have to choose wisely when to deploy those. So it's a game that you know has a very simple rules, and if you feel very constrained in the fact that you only have three dominoes to pick from and where you're playing, but it's one that opens up and becomes very difficult to play well and feel like you've made optimal moves over the course of the game. So really an enjoyable game. That is Renature. All right, top three. Number three, I have a game by Freedom and Freeze, uh, who's a hit and miss designer for sure, but has definitely made some classics such as you know Power Grid. And last year he made uh, Fast Loss. This this year he made Fium, which is a different piece than Fast Loss, certainly. It's a game that I think uh, begs almost comparison to Concordia, which is a famous Euro game from the, you know, one of the more famous Euro games from the last 10 years. And this basically has a similar card-driven action uh, mechanism where each turn you're just going to be playing one card and then doing what it says to do on the card. That's very similar to Concordia, and it you're just using that to get pieces out, played out onto the map. What I think distinguishes this game are, are a few different things. The first is that you're all contributing to the map in uh, a manner that, unlike you're claiming territory in Concordia, here you're all just building out, and once it's on the map, any player could use it. So if you put down a worker, another player could use that worker to meet their goals. Or if you build a building, another player could put a worker on that building to activate it. And that level of interactivity, I think, um, is something that sets this game apart. Also, the cards are, are you know very cleverly uh, implemented in that you essentially have to pay to get card after you play your cards. When you do a reset action to get your cards back, you have to pay to take cards back past a certain point. So you can use this as a way to call uh, cards from your hand once they become no longer useful. But it also means that. Um, as you're playing cards, you'll want to delay playing your best cards, even though you you want to get them out so you can take advantage of them, until the end, so you don't have to pay to get them back. So there's all these interesting tensions that are in the game that make it really, you know, something to think about. That. Um, so I think for me, this might actually supplant Concordiola. That game has, you know, many expansion maps and many... Uh, new rules and you know some new scoring tiles and a team variant so that game has had a life of its own for sure over the course of the year uh, but here because of the fact that you know it's just an inherently more interactive game it's one that I think we'll see well I won't, I won't say that for sure but it's one that I think because of the the innovations in the deck building mechanism and also the way that um, it feels more interactive. It's one that I think you know stands shoulder to shoulder at least with Concordia. So a really good game that is Fium. All right, my number two game for 2020 is My City. This is a Reiner Knizia game. Uh, this is um, again a, co uh, a campaign game rather. It's not cooperative at all. It's a, a tetromino game, like so a uh, puzzle -like piece playing game uh, that you're going to be playing over about 20 to 20 maybe 20 games, I guess, uh, that is going to be developing as a campaign game, like many games over recent years. And um, what's engaging about this game is that just the way that it tweaks rules over the course of those 20 games, it just is really a testament to Knizia's, uh talent as a designer. He has become, in some sense, notorious in uh, the hobby for... Um, for tweaking his games and then just selling them as a new boxed thing. So like you would have Ra, then Ra the dice game, then Priests of Ra and Razia, all using the same basic auction mechanism but with different scoring rules or different what you know, ones being a dice game or whatever. And he's you know, he's done that with a lot of his games. A lot of his games just feel like tweaks of his other games. And 
some people think that that's CO you know, derivative or somehow worthy of scorn. I, I tend to actually find it interesting and insightful into the way that he works as a designer. But here it's like you're getting all of those games that eventually make up a family of his games in one box. And it's just really exciting from a, a fan of you know game designers to see how the those ideas could tweak and change over the course of you know 20 or so games and much like i said about uh zombie teens evolution the reason why this works for me i think as a campaign game is because it has an addictive quality where you just will generally play maybe i think the game really change, turns on its head every third game and so you generally will play a th you know and each game lasts maybe 20 minutes or so so you generally will play you know a block of three games and feel like you've progressed through the campaign, but each of those three games has different rules within it. But then after that third game, you know that the rules are going to get you know turned on their head in a more significant way. So it really dangles the carrot for you to keep playing, like few of these um, these games ha have before. That and what's what's amazing about it still is that it never bogs down with rules. It's always uh, feels like a Kinetsu game in that the rules are very simple. The scoring objectives are simple but painful, and you know it's been it was just a, a real pleasure to play through that entire campaign. I uh, I had no problem getting it to the table, uh, pretty much uninterrupted until play we played through that whole thing, and that in a in a lot of ways makes it you know and a, it's a you know very non confrontational, very low barrier to entry game makes it almost the perfect game to have been playing during quarantine in my circumstances, so that's why it's high up on this list. It's really just a sterling design. That is my city. All right, and last but not least, the number one game of 2020, with all the asterisks, you know, that I haven't played every game, etc., is, for me, it is Anno 1800, and this is a game that's designed by Martin Wallace. It's, I have the German edition here. I think the U.S. edition is coming out very shortly. And this is a tech tree game, or a resource generation conversion game. Um, it's based on a popular computer game, which I have actually played. Um, also called Anno 1800. And uh, the, the basic idea of this game is that players are going to be generating resources, trading resources with other players. Um, it's a very uh, abstracted form of trading. You know, players can't really resist it, but they get a benefit if you use their resources. And using workers to generate resources to essentially either build more production buildings. There's essentially a production chain. You need to create, you know, wool to create sweaters to create, you know, aristocrats, you know, or, or what have you. And the, these production chains um, will also let you play cards. You start the game with a ha hand of cards. And basically every worker that you get is going to add a, a card to your hand. And the game ends... Once you get through all of those cards, eventually the game, the cards stop generating more cards, and they just start generating points. So the game's a bit of a race to kind of efficiently move through all your various modes of production and upgrading your modes of production to get these cards played and to score points before the game is triggered by somebody playing all of their cards. And uh, a lot of Martin Wallace's games, I think he has a reputation for being a designer who really prizes themes, even though he uses a lot of Euro or War game mechanisms. And this is one that, you know, and sometimes that prizing of theme comes at the expense of his streamlined mechanisms. He will add a rule just because it makes thematic sense, even if it makes the game less elegant, as people in the hobby like to say. Um, and this is a game that's put out by Cosmos in Germany. I, I assume they're going to release it in the U.S. also. Um, I, I mean, I know that's coming in the U.S. I, I'm just not sure of the publisher. But um, they are an esteemed... And actually, I realize Cosmos is my number two game as well this year. But they're a, a rightfully esteemed uh, German publisher who uh, you know, makes the games for the German family market. And even though this is a heavier game than My City, for certain, it's... Um, one that you could absolutely feel the development process. You know, they've ruthlessly cut out a lot of the rules that might be more thematic, I think. And it's they've delivered a game that flows very smoothly, that um, has a lot of clever mechanisms in it, and one that, you know, 
just has very quick turns. Each turn you're just doing one thing. It might be like I'm producing iron and I'm producing, you know, uh, glass so I can make a phonograph. And next turn. Yeah, it's it's literally just that for, you know, two two hours with each player just doing these micro turns going, you know, around the table. And that's just, you know, really satisfying because the game doesn't get bogged down, but it still has this arc of a grand strategy game. Um, there's no, you know, there's a lot of things that have been cut out, like a map. There's no map. Um, you could do, you know, you could, like, do, there's a tiny little bit of, shuffling tiles around in on your player board in front of you but it's not really much of a spatial game there's a lot of things you can imagine that games would have tacked onto here just because they were present in the computer game that have been stripped out here just for the sake of game flow and the game is much better i think for it um at the same time i think that the game is uh something that really surprised me about this game because although you um Basically, you're playing with the same cards each time. You have some various powers that uh, are randomly chosen that could alter what's possible in a game and what things you're going to be scoring. But because your your production chain, you, there's like 40 goods or whatever that you could produce, something like that. Uh, those are the same from game to game. What's surprising is how much I've felt that I've had replay value in this game. And that's been, you know something that I wasn't necessarily sure was going to be there. I've played it you know, several times now and really been surprised that my strategy has diverged versus what I've done. And that's partially because the cards are telling you to do something. It's partially because other players are producing some, something so you could go down a different route. And that's kind of like subtle player interaction is really enjoyable in the game. So, you know, it, it's, it's, I think, you know, a real, like, triumph for Martin Wallace, especially because it's a licensed game. It's based on a com pre-existing computer game. And it's put out by, you know, a strong publisher. So it's really good to see Martin Wallace working with this strong publisher in a way that makes a game that feels streamlined and really, you know, appeals to me. And all the, I'm not, not saying that his other games don't. I think Brass was one of my favorite games for sure last year. So this just really continues, you know, with seeing Martin Wallace going from strength to strength. So that is my, at least tentatively speaking, my top game of 2020. That is Anno 1800. And I guess I would say that that is a wrap for this year's top uh, top ten. Uh, so I do hope that you know it looks like here at least in the United States we are you know going getting to a point where we can start opening up. I'll be able to start gaming with people outside of my household. So hopefully I'll be able to start delivering more videos. Hopefully the rest of the world is not far behind the U.S. in that regard. And you know I, I hope everybody you know stay safe, uh, you know act sensibly, and you know. It get you know hopefully gets back to gaming in whatever form that that takes so um you know thanks for watching and uh you know best of luck you know getting getting to back to normal